Welcome to this video from Learn the Electrics. In this video, we will introduce the terms selectivity, discrimination and coordination as applied to choosing the sizes or ratings of protected devices for electrical circuits. First of all, discrimination. This expression has now been replaced with the word selectivity, but you will still hear both words being used. Selectivity is the coordination and selection of two or more protected devices so that the device that is intended to operate first does so, whilst others in the same circuit do not. And coordination is the correct selection of protective devices that are cascaded or in series to ensure the safety and continuity of supply to those parts of an installation that are fault free, whilst those parts with a fault will be disconnected from the supply. And, let's be honest, selectivity and coordination have pretty much the same objective. Look at this very basic example. We have a typical domestic arrangement. A 100 amp main fuse protects the installation. A 32 amp breaker feeds a socket circuit and the kettle has a 13 amp fuse installed. All of a sudden the kettle develops a fault and significant fault current flows. Which protected device would you expect to operate first? We would hope it was the fuse in the kettle that went first, or perhaps the breaker in the consumer unit, but certainly not the main fuse. So how do we ensure this? How do we select devices so that the device nearest the fault operates first and leaves all the other fault-free circuits still energised? After all, just because the kettle is faulty, we shouldn't suddenly lose all the lights and plunge the house into darkness. Before we move on, we should look at the different abbreviations used for electrical devices. This first chart shows those devices that offer only overcurrent and short circuit protection. They do not give any residual current protection. The next chart shows the RCD devices that give residual current protection only. These devices must always be installed along with the device from the first chart as they offer no overcurrent or short circuit protection at all. Also shown on this chart is an RCM or residual current monitor. Please be very clear about this device. A residual current monitor is not an RCD. It offers no protection at all. All that an RCM does is to monitor residual currents and to warn the user if they exceed a certain level. A residual current monitor will not disconnect the circuit. Now we show two devices that perform the combined functions of residual current protection and overload and short circuit protection. Because they perform combined protective functions, they can be installed as standalone protected devices for individual circuits. We can look now at simple coordination between RCDs. Regulation 536.4.1.4 Part 2 on page 173 of the wiring regulations tells us that where two RCDs are in series with each other, then the upstream RCD must be of the selective S type or time delayed type, and that the ratio of the tripping currents of the two RCDs should be at least 3 to 1. But why choose a ratio of 3 to 1? If we look at a 30 milliamp RCD, we know that it will operate when the residual current, the difference between phase and neutral, approaches 30 milliamps. The RCD is designed to operate anywhere between 50% and 100% of its rating, which means that for a 30 milliamp RCD it could trip anywhere between 15 milliamps and 30 milliamps. In practice it will often be around 25 milliamps. A residual current between 0 and 50% should not cause the RCD to operate, which is why we do a times half RCD test when verifying circuits. Transferring the same logic to a 100 milliamp RCD this will operate at or before 100 milliamps of residual current. This means anywhere between 50 milliamps and 100 milliamps as shown here. And between 0 and 50 milliamps 
is the no trip zone. If we compare a 30 milliamp RCD to a 100 milliamp device, we can see the reason for this 3 to 1 requirement. If these two devices are cascaded together, in other words, in series, and a 30 milliamp fault is detected, then only the 30 milliamp device will trip, since 30 milliamps is still in the no trip zone for the 100 milliamp RCD. If we have a circuit protected by a 100 milliamp RCD, with two 30 milliamp RCDs downstream of it, we can see that RCD 21 in this example is protecting load number 1 and RCD 22 is protecting load number 2. If a fault should develop in load number 2, only RCD 22 should operate. RCD 1 should remain in the on position and continue to supply power to RCD 21 and load number 1 since this part of the installation does not have a fault. We only want load number 2 to be disconnected. If we look at a typical domestic installation, a circuit has been taken from the consumer unit to the garage. At the garage, a small two-circuit consumer unit is installed. This contains a 30 milliamp RCCB and two MCBs. We now have two 30 milliamp RCD devices in series with each other, one in the house and one in the garage. If a residual current fault happens in the garage, which RCD device will operate first? If it is the house RCD, then all that part of the house will lose power. And this is not correct coordination. We need to be certain that the garage RCCB only will trip. Correct coordination tells us that we should install a separate S-Type 100 milliamp RCD in the house consumer unit. This way we have achieved our 3 to 1 difference between devices. The 100 milliamp device will respond a little slower and the 30 milliamp device will operate first, well before the larger device even thinks about it. Only the garage circuits will be affected. Looking now at selectivity between overcurrent protective devices, Regulation 536.4.1.2.1 on page 172 tells us that where selectivity is required, the design can be verified by a desk study, taking into account the relevant product standards. Desk study then is just sitting down with a pencil, some data about the fuses or breakers and comparing the response times to overload currents. It's not complicated and we can keep things simple. And we will use the data chart in Appendix 3 on page 362 onwards. For this scenario, we have a distribution board populated with BS88-3 fuses. A circuit is to be taken from one of the fuses into the cellar where a small consumer unit is installed with just two MCBs, a 16 amp breaker for the socket and a 6 amp one for the lights. There will only be two sockets on this circuit and the attached equipment draws less than 12 amps in total. The lighting circuit feeds two luminaires, drawing less than one amp. The question is, what size BS88-3 fuse, shown here as a red striped fuse, should be fitted in the distribution board to achieve proper selectivity if the cellar sockets develop an earth fault? We begin our desk study by looking at the chart for BSEN60898 Type B breakers as found on page 370 of the wiring regulations. Along the bottom is the prospective fault currents and this goes up at a logarithmic scale. Nothing complicated. Each of the vertical lines starts as 1, 2, 3 etc up to 10. Then the lines have a value 10 amps, 20 amps, 30 amps and so on. And then 100, 200, 300, you get the idea. The left hand side is the time to trip in seconds and again as a logarithmic scale. 1, 2, 3, then 10, 20, 30 and 100, 200, 300 and so on. We will need to use the main part of the chart, the curved lines. Let us suppose that we have a slight overload of 70 amps on our cellar sockets. 70 amps will not cause an instantaneous response with a 16 amp MCB. 
It will take several seconds to cause the breaker to trip. But how long? Let's work it out. Find 70 amps along the bottom row. Follow the vertical 70 amp line up until it meets the curve that is labelled 16 amps as shown at the top. Use a ruler or a straight edge if needed. I do. Where the two lines cross, follow your eye to the left hand side to find the number of seconds, which in this case is about 16 seconds. So, a BSEN 60898 Type B breaker with an overload of 70 amps will take 16 seconds to operate. The table is a little fiddly to use at first, but with practice you will get better. Now we can look at the response time for a 20 amp BS88-3 fuse. Exactly the same process as before. First, find the chart on page 364. Now, look for 70 amps along the bottom and follow this up the vertical line until it meets the curve for a 20 amp fuse. Then check the seconds on the left hand side and we have a response time of 4 seconds. So, a 20 amp BS88-3 fuse with the same 70 amps of overload current will operate in 4 seconds. If we put these into a table for comparison, we can see that the upstream device, the fuse, will operate long before the downstream MCB. This is clearly incorrect selectivity and bad coordination. Let us look now at the response time for a 32 amp fuse. The same page, page 364, with the same 70 amps of overload current, the response time is shifted up the chart and it is now 300 seconds. Putting this answer into the table, we can see that the 32 amp breaker takes 300 seconds to blow, but the MCB takes only 16 seconds to operate. Therefore, the MCB will operate first, the fault current will disappear from the circuit and the 32 amp fuse will not blow. This means that the cellar sockets will be isolated, but the cellar lights will stay on. This is correct selectivity and coordination. This has only been a short introduction to the design process and in summary we should always consider the implications of cascading two or more protective devices. We want the device that is nearest to the fault to operate first. This ensures that only the part of the installation with a fault will be disconnected and those parts that are without a fault will remain energised. As shown in our scenario, a fault on the cellar sockets should not affect the lights and plunge the cellar into darkness, a dangerous situation to be in. This is essential for the safety of the users and for maintaining an electrical supply to other, possibly critical parts of the installation. And there we are. We hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you have added more knowledge to your mental toolbox. Please click on subscribe below to have access to all of our videos and to be sure of not missing our next Tech Tips video. Subscribing also helps us too and we do appreciate this. Typing in Learn Electrics or one word into the YouTube search bar will also give you access to all of our videos at any time. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.